Hi, I'm Brett from H&R Studio. This is Lauren, the other half of H&R Studio, and we are excited to welcome you today to a fantastic conversation. I'm going to let Lauren do the introduction. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us for this evening's live stream panel called Between Abstraction and Representation with our guests Matt Tomesco and Greg Tomesco tuning in from Philadelphia in New Jersey. So we're really excited to discuss the differences between and actually not so surprising parallels also between abstract and representational art. And we're really grateful to Matt and Greg for joining us because they are very busy, which makes us all the more appreciative of their time. This panel is pre-recorded, which is exactly why you're getting this introduction. So what I want to make sure you guys are aware of before we kick this off is that Matt, Greg, Brett, and myself are all very grateful for your support during this current climate. Um, simply by watching a panel like this, you're supporting artists both as individuals and as small business entities. So you can learn more about H&R Studio by visiting the link to our website featured on our channel or just subscribing, especially as um, we'll be producing more content such as this panel series in the future. And also make sure to look in the video description for the links to Greg and Matt's website so that you can learn more about them as well. So again, thanks for tuning in. And with that, we're going to let Matt and Greg introduce themselves and we hope that you enjoy Between Abstraction and Representation. Um, well, I really appreciate, I really appreciated the questions that you asked, and uh, I guess I should introduce Yeah, myself. you're great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Greg. Square one. Yeah. <laughs> Greg Tomesco, New York-based artist, and, and, and a painter extraordinaire. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, literally, yeah. Um, that I've... Uh, Graduated from the New York Academy, uh, you know, exhibited uh, various places all over. Um, and I have at some point uh, developed quite an affinity for patterns. Actually, I think I always had an affinity for patterns. I guess to me, it was uh, kind of like when you're little and you have food that you like and you're just like, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's basically the type of feeling that I get when I see some sort of pattern and uh, maybe later in life it, it took a while to uh, conceptualize that and incorporate that into art making but in essence uh, that's a driving factor. <laughs> in that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'm Matt Tomasco, I'm Greg's uh, younger brother. And uh, I'm a painter as well. I went to Tyler School of Art. Uh, I also uh, have been working as an artist for 10 years. And uh, I've done a lot of public art projects and community art projects, mm -hmm. uh, as well as maintain a, a studio practice. And I also make money in the art world by working at a gallery in Philadelphia and New York. We just opened a gallery in New York. so. Awesome. At the worst possible time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be honest, you, like, you guys know we've been fans of your work for a really long time. Uh, and fans of you guys as people for a really long time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hashtag h and nepotism. Um, but I, what fascinates me so much about you guys' work is, is and I, I don't, I want to be really careful about not grouping you guys together too much. You guys are obviously very, very succinct individuals and your work is very individual with very, very different trajectories. Um, but again, Greg, with your penchant for, for pattern and Matt, you know, I, I got to kind of know your work through incorporation of text and things like that. Um, you guys both work within very, I, I think you guys are both really, really good at taking languages and kind of dissecting them to create your own visual language in turn. 
And what's interesting is, again, you guys both kind of blur that edge between what's considered more abstract art versus more representational art. And I don't want to hold to those two terms too solidly either because, you know, they are kind of nebulous in and of themselves. Um, so I wanted to, to get, just get you guys thoughts on it. Like we've been looking at your work and admiring it for years now. We know you guys, but I don't know if we've ever really had the chance to delve into what you guys, what, what your process is, what your impetus is, and then where you're going to go with it. Um, so I hope you don't mind. Uh, I know it's probably bad manners to look off screen, but I'm just double checking the <laughs> questions <laughs> that I have. I want to be, I want to be prepared. Um, so again, as I said, the both of you guys make artwork that kind of blurs the boundaries between what's usually considered abstraction and representation. Um, so for each of you, this question is a bit like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And I guess we'll start just because from our screen, we'll start with the, the view of you that we have. So we'll go from, from Greg to Matt. Um, did you, Greg, did you begin making more abstract or more representational artwork first? Uh, abstract, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. I was younger. Um, and I think that was the type of thing I looked at uh, more often when I was drawn to. And we definitely made artwork together quite a bit. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, younger mm -hmm. and definitely story making uh, also quite a bit. And uh, I think the thing that really affected me in terms of the thing that I was trying to make, maybe when I was quite young and now, but you get lost at some point along the way in trying to achieve different things was uh, the feeling that you get from something. And for one example, I guess, I remember going to the Philadelphia Museum and the thing that made the largest impact on me, I mean, there's many paintings and sculptures that made a large impact on me, but there's a, a sculpture by Miro called Nightbird at the Philadelphia Museum. And it's a really large bronze abstraction Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. It, it's just a terrifying sculpture. Because <laughs> <laughs> that pierces something. And that's I don't like, know what it yeah. was about it, but it was a feeling. Mm -hmm. So it's like a feeling more than it is a bird. But it's also oh, yeah. like what I didn't know what the like, title was yeah. until later in life. Yeah. I didn't mm -hmm. know what it was at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I knew it definitely was terrifying. So, <laughs> so how did you end up then? Because I, I would say your work is now a little bit more representational. So how did you end well, up? Well, it's still going for a feeling. You know? mm -hmm. yes. And I think that uh, to some degree, abstraction, it, it no longer produces that feeling. Uh, because we've gotten so, it, because we're so, um, just overwhelmed by it. We're, we're just, we see it every day, you know. It's so part of our lives that we don't register it. Mm -hmm. So it can be more shocking to be a little bit more. Yeah. But that's, that's really, that's really interesting, Greg, that you started first with, with abstract work. And again, you know, as we show your images, I think, you know, that, that bridge between abstraction and representation is, is rather unabashedly shown within your work. Um, but did you ever conversely react to any representational piece of art that way? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, definitely at the Philadelphia Museum the as well. What, what, what? The, the Peter Paul Rubens piece with the, oh, yeah. with the liver. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that one's a really great one. Yeah. There is a Rubens piece at the Philadelphia Museum mm -hmm. when uh, Prometheus. Prometheus is having his liver eaten out by an eagle. Oh my and God! It's yeah, visceral and very uh, baroque in its look. <laughs> yeah, and and Rubens is very visceral, even when he's painting like plump, pale women. You know, there's something very tactile. It's a it's a real celebration of of 
of the paint itself. So I can imagine if he got a little bit gory, it would. Oh, you know, yeah. There was a painting of a tree there that I can't remember the name, but it was like a really obscure Swiss painter that I was always mm -hmm. like, I can't believe how real that tree is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the same room, there's also a painting. Uh, it was like a 19th century French painting, uh, oh. like an or Orientalism painting. Of oh, like yeah. An Ara yeah, you know the painting. Know the painting. Of uh, this Arab with a sword, and it's amazing. You know, mm -hmm. just a remarkable. Yeah, the really level of fun. Detail, yeah, yeah, the level of detail, and that was an extraordinary painting to behold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, that's 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 really interesting because again, it's you know you wonder with representation if it's if it's like the magic of making the illusion, which can be really alluring, you know. Whereas with abstraction, sometimes it really is like you know cutting to the chase of of, of right. something's present in both, and I think that yeah. that is a really important point uh in the in like the differentiation like i think i think people make a differentiation but they're actually mm -hmm. like a part of the same line because it's mm -hmm. like all of that stuff is present in the orientalist painting mm -hmm. uh, it's it's present in the painting of the tree mm -hmm. but it, it's like artists in the 20th century decided to focus and and to like sort of bring it that out that like the feeling of it uh, yeah, or, but, you know something that goes beyond just the convincing reality because the it, like that's exactly like it, like what you just said like it's an illusion, mm -hmm. so it's constructed, it's conceit from the beginning, you know. So it's like it's a it's a system of symbols, it's a system of things, and then if you start emphasizing that over, you know, you can almost like make an illusion that is just like it's like uh, just a pure thought or something rather than a totally convincing like set or something. Yeah. So yeah. that's, so then Greg, if you, if you went from, if you, if you started working at, like how old were you approximately when you started making like definitively abstract artworks? I don't know, probably high school, but I, you know, I, I'd say it was more just responding to the things that I, so mm -hmm. <clears throat> the things yeah. that he is are are you know, like that at the time. I actually have a story. He he wrote a uh, or he he was uh, uh, he made a drawing for a publication in our high school, and the story was about being lost as a child. Hmm. And I think I as really an adult, people this. would be like, "I'm going to show. I'm going to draw a picture of a child that's lost." Mm -hmm. um, but Greg was, he wanted to put it in the mind of the kid who was lost. And so he drew it like he was a kid. So everyone was kind of like a stick figure or a clown or whatever. Oh, man. Like, and sort of like invented that like scene around it to get to the, like that truth of like what it would be like to be that kid. I, I think that that is that. like, <laughs> but it's at the core of what we're talking about. It's sort of like an mm -hmm. invent, you know, abstraction is kind of like this inventive oh, yeah. fiction to get to a truth rather than trying to invent like a truth uh, or like to have something that's like uh, a truth that conveys nature or something. I don't yeah. know if that's mm -hmm. a good definition. But, uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, really I that drawing of Greg's uh, very well. I was very impressed. <laughs> See, this is the advantage of having, yeah. you know, like two panelists who know each other so well as we can get these these tidbits and then, uh, if, you know, if we ever need to blackmail you. No. Yeah, you're not going to get that image. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll flip the tables a bit, Matt. I, I am really, I am curious because with your work, I gen, like I could have, I could have maybe guessed that, that Greg would have started more abstractedly, but with your work, I really can't tell at all. Did you start more abstractedly or representationally? Such a great realist painter. Well, yeah. He was, he was out of this world. <laughs> I don't know what happened, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I started with figure painting. And, mm -hmm. and I, and I was like, really, I was like, convinced, like, that's what you need to do. Like, th this is like, all, you know, all, all of art. And then I got to a certain point where I just, I just like, I, I started like, because I hate, I like hated 
conceptualism and I hated minimalism. I like, mm -hmm. I like, would like literally like scream at strangers on the street about like, can you believe like minimalism is a thing? Like, and I like, stop talking to me, like, just get away from me. <laughs> I'm getting on the subway. Yeah. <laughs> But like, oh, I wish we had footage of that. <laughs> yeah, because I like had to, you know, it, I had to think about it so much. I like tried to reconcile mm -hmm. what I saw as this chasm of like difference. Mm -hmm. And I do uh, remember he had this great painting when he was, I think, a freshman in college, of his friend going to the barber shop, <laughs> getting a haircut, oh, yeah. and drinking a beer at the same time. <laughs> and I swear, yeah. this painting looks like an early Lucian Freud painting. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah that's awesome that's so, awesome don't love it it's it's been so i like started as a definitely a realist and then mm -hmm. I, I just totally fell in love with abstraction conceptual art like all these other things and i try to find a way to bring them all together because i think painting does that i think like all of painting does that like you look at yeah. the Mona Lisa, and there's like a conceptual element to that oh yeah mm -hmm. oh yeah so it's like if, if something is art, it's conceptual. It's also visual. It's mm -hmm. also like has a feeling. It, it has all mm -hmm. these things. So all it is is just taking a certain part of it and like and, and blowing that part up. If mm -hmm. that's what you're doing. Or like and de-emphasizing other parts of it. But then so like that's where I, I really became curious about that and really and I really wanted to do it. Like I was actually like early in my career, I was doing portraits and was like pretty, I was supporting myself. And mm -hmm. then I was like, I was like, I could do this for this. I could probably do this for the rest of my life, but I would mm -hmm. be really bored. And I would yeah. be something that like over and over again, instead of exploring. And, yeah. you know, I regret it all the time because I'm poor, but like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but <laughs> like, you know, at least I'm doing the stuff that I'm interested in. Right? I think. Yeah. You know, I went really far in like one direction Mm -hmm. And I went far in another direction, and then and I'm sort of like bringing it together now, and I feel like it's a little bit more balanced, and you know I don't feel like I've resolved. It's sort of like you know I'm sure you, you both understand, art is like a chess game that you'll just like never win. It's just like right. yeah, you know that's a great analogy. Yeah. That's a really great analogy, and and I like what you're what you're talking to Matt about the importance of concept um, because you know we try to stress when we're teaching here at h and that there's a difference between a piece of artwork and just craft you know yeah. or just a study or just something you know there's a difference between you know as much as we extol certain technical virtues that's that's like that's like a springboard to get you somewhere yeah. you know and yeah. and artwork gets well when people make things without thinking about that, things kind of get mechanical and and kind of fall by the wayside. Yeah. And, and I feel like, you know, the history books don't remember the people who were just great craftspeople. Yep. You know. Right. Out there when you dig in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think this, um, um, yeah, to me, I, I, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm really interested in what, uh, in what you guys were talking about, um, you know, before about representational, you know, painting being this sort of, uh, you know, artifice, this sort of um, illusionary thing. And I think that to, you know, to make good paintings, you have to, you have to sort of understand, like, you know, how to how to deal with that element. Um, I personally like wasn't, I, I've never been, or yeah, I haven't been comfortable with it in years and that's why I started making sculpture rather than making painting. Uh, and it's interesting to see how, you know, each of you have, you know, dealt with that uh, by, um, you know, adding different layers of, you know, abstraction, you know, to different degrees, you know, whether it's patterns or, uh, a, uh, moving towards more like you know geometric you know designs with text it's uh, it, um, uh, I think that you know representation is an important tool but but uh, I, I you know I admire that both of you have a handle on how to uh, you know you know uh, 
you know, approach that with caution because of the, you know, illusionary nature can be, you know, it can be fraught, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I and mean, I think that that's actually like one of the things that led me down that road was like realizing mm -hmm. that illusion is itself kind of like a, uh, like a function or something. And then like you, I mean, you brought up like how, like I've been working with texts and stuff and I, it was kind of the same thing. It's almost the same thing, I think. Or I found like that's what, like, I that's how I like started, so like on this like road is that like if you paint like the letter T, mm. it's like, it's like a shape, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and like a child like doesn't know the difference between that and anything else, and like mm -hmm. neither do you really unless you are an adult and you like look at it, and you remember all the times that you've seen the letter T and it goes in your brain and it like tells you that's a symbol. And it's kind of, that's like what an illusion is too, yeah. what a, a realist thing is. And so like that in and of itself, like realizing that you're basically like juggling symbols when you're like making a painting. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to like make a totally convincing, um, like flawless scene. I wanted to make it clear that I was juggling symbols. And so I want to mm -hmm. like pick them up and make the viewer aware of it too. And like, uh, and think about the nature of perception, think about like, when you're looking at something, like what are you looking at? You know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I'd like to take really familiar things and sort of present them in really unfamiliar ways. And so even mm -hmm. if people know it, they don't know it. It's new now. You know. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's something you guys are both so damn good at taking at, at making very very complicated images. And and that's the thing. Sometimes I get a little frustrated when people get on a bit of a high horse about which is better abstraction or representation. It's like, well, no matter how loose or tight or representational or abstract the image is, you have to think about a lot. You have to think about like spatial volume. You have to think about color relationships. You have to think about compositions. And the both of you guys just really kick ass at all of that. I mean, it's it's like all of you guys' pieces are like these windows into these worlds. And, and you know, for me, again, that, that's, it's like a form of, of, escapism you know and like a, a basic study that you do in a classroom or just trying to prove like if you give me 70 hours I can perfectly render a uh, human bicep you know something about that kind of rings hollow compared to something that is I again I don't want to use the word a loser you know uh, you know like I, I don't I don't want to again make it sound like you guys are magicians with this big reveal and you know everyone's kind of with, with hearing a sculptor talk about 2D stuff, I hear certain <laughs> things a lot. But but the bottom line is, you know, it's they're both very, very complex languages and they're very symbolically rich. And, you know, Greg, to see the patterns that you see and then paint them and Matt to see like, especially the work where you're you're taking, um, you know, you're, you're almost like collaging from like, periodicals and like flyers for grocery stores and stuff and just, you guys just create these really really intricate layers that are uh, yeah. I mean it, it takes it takes a minute for the eye to move through the work but in a good way in a really really good way is uh yeah like a master of of the, of the complicated image well, well Matt and I were having a conversation before this about the realism versus abstraction and the uh, questions that you asked us and I, I asked him, you know, like, uh, what was the question I asked him? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was like, well, what do you think know, about what, abstractions? What, what, what side do you fall <laughs> yeah. down on? Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, what side do you fall down yeah. on ab abstraction or realism? Okay. Yeah. And Matt said abstraction. And I said, yeah, abstraction. I think everything is abstract. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. it was yeah. that, you know, it in painting it is an abstraction no matter what you can't make a three-dimensional thing two-dimensional that's not possible you know? yeah. So yeah it's your interpretation of the world and whether you are the most realist skilled painter out there it's still an interpretation mm -hmm. it's still an abstraction it, and it just because it's so convincing doesn't mean that it's not an abstraction mm -hmm. and to acknowledge that is uh, very important because as you were saying, you can't just be a, 
a craftsman and have the most realistic looking bicep, but mm-hmm. no one's going to look at it because they're like, oh, that's bicep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. There, yep. there has yeah. to be. <laughs> all right. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. All right. Got it. Moving <laughs> on. Exactly. Exactly. And, 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 you know, in a way, like that whole idea that as, you know, so that idea has been with us as human beings. And if we see something from the Greek era or something, <laughs> something oh, like, the, uh, like a Greek vase, we might say that, it, yeah, it's pretty abstract. And But maybe people in Greece at the time were like, oh, really, that one? Yeah, sure, but this one's better. And it, and it has a, a higher degree of realism, but it's still really abstract. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And yeah. so it's really not a question of abstract versus realism. It's just real to who. And yeah, to, to, that's to great. Kind of like the feeling, the feeling that you're able to get out of it. And so, yeah. So I think like what, what as it relates to today, how do we get there? I mean, I think first, like going to ancient Greece or something like that is way too far away. I, I don't think we can really truly understand what were in people's heads, but mm-hmm. definitely to the Renaissance, we can understand. And that mm-hmm. whole window to the world, as you were saying, and um, maybe it, like when Bruno Leschke painted that painting out in Florence right by the Duomo and he puts up mm-hmm. the, that, that, um, just frame around the area that he's painting and then you can see this is a picture of the world yeah Um, the convincing abstraction that is that that we still live with because you can see a photograph and we're like that's so real but we know as painters that it can be so distorted and why you know and that idea that Bruno Leschke presented is so so convincing to people's perceptions you know mm-hmm. and that's why it's a convincing it's actually an abstraction that that is real and mm-hmm. we're always trying to get out of that and I, I and i think like during the renaissance they had this sort of thing where it was a window and a an ideal that they held up that somehow they're getting closer to the truth you know mm. We we are so close to getting that three dimensional thing, two dimensional, and beyond that, we're getting closer to God. You know, mm-hmm. uh, but I think like in modernity, it really got flipped around, and they 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 acknowledge that no, you are making a lie. You mm-hmm. are making a lie, and we acknowledge that, and therefore. We can make whatever we want, and it's mm. that it's. Uh, I, I think when Picasso says something, it's a is a pretty Nietzschean point of view that it's a, art is a lie to get to a higher truth. Mm. And yeah, that, that's that that's total inversion of the Renaissance, but also in the same way, getting to the same type of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's so like that, a. Yeah. Harvey Harvey Citron shared a quote with us recently, and I can't remember to whom it's attributed. Uh, I'll remember Matisse. at like two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, Matisse, Matisse saying yeah. Um, exactactitude is not perfection. Yeah, yeah, that, that is, oh, that's, right. that's exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. that, exactly it. You know, yeah. like even the super tight drawing behind us. Like if you get close to it, you'll see like all these frenetic little hatch marks. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I think, yeah, I, I. I would probably agree with that that adage that everything is inherently abstract in yeah. terms of what you see on the surface and in terms of its yeah. perception. And, yeah, and I think it's just abstracted to different levels. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. and if you do go back to, I, I mean, um, you know, my bias, you know, being primarily a sculptor is that, uh, like, you know, you look at those sculptures from, you know, the Renaissance or, you know, ancient Greece, and there is a tremendous amount of, um, abstraction from, you know, from naturalism, but, you know, they're, they're able to take the patterns that are, uh, you know, present in nature and kind of lay those over on this 
stylized, abstracted form and it reads more naturalistic than, 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 than you might expect. And, uh, uh, but, um, you know, having, you know, having studied, you know, those having, you know, done a, you know, three dimensional, um, uh, like, you know, having, you know, actually, you know, sculpted and copied the Belvedere torso, uh, it is surprising how much abstraction is, um, is there. And, and I think those ideas were kind of, I don't know if they were kind of lost or, you know, forgotten by the time that, um, a, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not really sure how to, how to, um, you know, how to make sense of how, how those ideas seem to have been kind of lost that people don't recognize how mm -hmm. abstract those are. It's hard. It's, it's a, it's a hard thing for me to, um, I feel like uh, it's, been, it's become like almost like a different, like it's, it's almost like they're, you know, it's been translated into a different language, but like yeah. the, the, the <laughs> And one of the things that I'm really fascinated in is like, um, like that moment of transition, I think happened mm. in the 20th century where like you look at like even early abstraction, mm -hmm. um, like uh, Kandinsky, mm -hmm. that is very much like a, it's still a window, like it's still like, it's still like the traditional sense of like looking in. Um, and it's like related to that, like, you know, all of these artists like intuitively understood, like, you know, you're distorting the body if you're making the body. Kandinsky is mm -hmm. just like taking color to its mm -hmm. extreme, but the painting itself is still something you're looking into. But I feel like nowadays uh, you have a painting on a wall and it's not, you're not looking into it, you're looking at it and you're looking at the world around you and like mm -hmm. the implication of the world right. around you, and the implication of the viewer too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a painting is almost yeah. like a sculpture now. Right. And so it's and it's not that these ideas are lost, it's just that they're like communicated in different ways right. uh, or embedded in different ways. Mm -hmm. Uh having spent a lot of time uh working in um um museums um um um, um that um reminds me that we would, you know, always refer to things as art objects and, you know, right. that, that's, that, mm -hmm. you know, in this, in this, you know, in this contemporary culture, we refer to things as objects. And, um, I think you're right, Matt, that we, we, yeah, we don't see them as, um, you know, illusionary windows anymore there. It's, you know, it's about the materiality of the, of the object. Which your work really comments beautifully on. I mean, my God, because you're taking that materiality and elevating it, you know, you really yeah. make, it's, it's really, it's really astutely done, which is, which is awesome because the, the question I wanted to follow up the original one was, was what are you guys working on now? So, you know, to recap for, for those who are watching, we have Greg, whose work we've been bringing up, whose work looks more uh, slightly representational, but Greg started painting abstractedly. Matt, whose work looks more conventionally abstract but who started painting representationally so matt is you know, kind of you know like a little circle the other way around <laughs> yeah so uh matt as you provided such an awesome segue i was going to ask what what does you guys's work look like now yeah so i think you know what i've been really fascinated by i mean it's you know exactly what we've been talking about all along it's just that i've been interested in like how a material can operate both like uh, visually, like illusionistically, but also operate as a metaphor. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, that began as 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 language. It began mm -hmm. as just incorporate. Well, I mean, I guess it really began as like a figure or something. So it like yeah. stood in, a figure stood in as an illusion, and then it became language, and then it became finding materials on the street and like mm -hmm. working with asphalt and it's mm. working with coal you know, we all have associations yeah. with things. There's, you know, it's still this like beautiful material. It's so dark and like deep and mm -hmm. shiny and, um, and, it, and it really works like in like a bold design, but then at the same time, it speaks to the climate. It speaks to our built environment. It speaks mm -hmm. to controlling resources. And, it, and there's just like, you know, I don't necessarily want to say one way or the other, like, I, I I don't think I don't want my work to be didactic. I just like mm -hmm. that, like 
there's something there that exists that's whole and I want to put that in there so people can look at it, see it, react to it, see it in a new way and maybe reconsider, mm -hmm. you know? So it's sort of like, it gets it, you know, cause we, asphalt is everywhere. It's like crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's like 90% of our experience is like walking on asphalt. Yeah. And we think about it, you know? <laughs> and yeah. Like, maybe we should, <laughs> you know? So. No, but you know, the thing, the thing that's so, that's so interesting is, you know, people, people will say, well, you know, the old masters were purists or you have to be a purist in terms of the materials you use. And like, Diego Velasquez mixed sand in with his paints. Like if, the, you know, people sometimes kind of overly, they, they assume that the old masters did what they did because they had total creative license and they didn't between no, there was a, a different real, market. You know, romanticism. And, yeah, there's, it, it's, you know, extremely romanticized. I, 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 yeah. um, I think like, you know, um, you know, marble was used because it was available and it's a soft stone that's you know easy to carve it's it you know it happens to look pretty nice too uh but I, you know i i yeah i think that yeah, um you know like it has all these veins in it too you know? yeah <laughs> yeah and and the thing is i think being able to use a more ubiquitous material like what you're doing man even what brett does incorporating like oriented strand board and stuff into his work it's kind of like a punk rock attitude towards just the world that we're always kind of submerged in, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, which is really, really well, I, cool. I, I mean, it's, you know, it's part of the language and, you know, lexicon of our culture. It's, it's, you know, that's part of what we exist with in our natural environment. And we're, yeah. you know, reappropriating those things to, yeah, to also, say something else. You know, if you're using marble now, there's also an association with Western art. Yeah. So, yeah. Like you could, like it maybe wasn't always the case because it was just like a soft stone that was like convenient to use because it was right on that mountain over there and you just like cut a chunk off and you like make a thing out of it. But if you do it now, like you're mm -hmm. going out of your way to like make something yeah. and it has an association. That's right. Like, Absolutely. It's part of the reading of like what you're communicating to like, so you're making a white marble statue. Like mm -hmm. you're consciously doing that. And so, right. like, mm -hmm. I think that for my work, I'm just trying to be conscious of, like, the things that I use, what it says, mm -hmm. what it would say to other people, what they might feel about it. And, like, I don't know. I don't, I don't actually have any answers. I guess I'm just, like, throwing a bunch of, like, questions up in the air. <laughs> like, that's how it kind of feels when I make it work, you know? No, so. but I think that's, that's poignant, too. I, I, you know, I don't know if art should always be, like, a finite statement. Yeah, you know, it's kind of it might be self defeating if it is, or if it already has all the answers. What's the point of it being made? Yeah. You know, so yeah. I I love, and again, I think a lot of people would look at my work and they wouldn't assume this because it you know like that's silver leaf. So I make it I make a choice to use these very anachronistic media, um, but I I regardless of how you know whether or not it's like a medieval gilding thing or or asphalt, I love when materials are used and integrated in a way that does have a statement, you know, so it's, I think, I think it's really, I think it's really cool. And again, it goes back to, you know, when you started making work by take, especially like those little flyers that are like on plasticky, shiny paper from like grocery stores. And then the way you started arranging them and I was looking and I was like, okay, there's this punctuation okay. here. There's this yeah. here, this color here. I was like, oh shit, I can look at this thing for like six hours and wonder what's going on, you know? I feel that way because I was, it, it almost felt unhealthy, like my level of obsession with those things. I, like I was in like a beautiful mind where I was like, oh, everything's connected. <laughs> I was like, putting this together, like these tiny little thin pieces of like, you know, cutting out of a magazine. I was just like, all right, I feel like I'm getting too crazy. Like I got to go back. That's why I started painting again because I was like getting too obsessed. I was like, this is getting too, too, too nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what what your your paintings this is interesting too because you've you've gone from that to to again now integrating like actual painted images with aspects yeah. so it's like you're doing you're really kind of coming full circle in a lot of ways right yeah i mean i i think that there was a uh i i've been i've been thinking about that for a long time i mean i've been thinking i love painting and i and like mm -hmm. i think i was like 
I was making these abstract paintings that were so free and so textured and so abstract, like totally non-objective abstraction, like not even based on anything, just process based, like, mm -hmm. and, and it was really fun. But then I was like, I need to like rein it in and like, cause it wasn't like, as like, I wanted to like have some kind of like, um, get back to like the conceptual, like getting back to the, like the, like building meaning, you know, cause it almost felt like mm -hmm. it was like destroying meaning as much as possible. And, and having it be like as like, um, like, like your gut feeling as much as possible. So then I wanted to have the same feeling where it hit you in the gut, but it was mm -hmm. intellectual as well. And that's where I started just, you know, built like making a composition, but then building it painstakingly by mm. cutting one tiny little piece at a time, connecting. I mean, really like you actually, I should just give you this painting. <laughs> it's like, it has like- I just fit know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it because it's like I literally connected like lines of like articles over a year. Oh my god! And found like connections between like articles and all these different stories happening all over the country, and the and the literal like lines intertwine like all there over the country. No yeah. Serial killers involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. but it is it is it is kind of a it, 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 yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> It just sounds like that's the sort of thing I think and I'm like, oh, fun, yeah. you know. <laughs> I thought too, until I like had a mental breakdown, like halfway through. <laughs> it's just like a cool painting, but like, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, but, you know. So anyway, I think that like you know, painting again, using those ideas, but then like fully employing this concept of like, you know, it's it's like building the illusion but destroying the illusion mm -hmm. building the meaning, finding the connections but like not like not totally getting anything there like it's like i don't want it to be totally convincing like every little line is like different i've painted it differently you know mm -hmm. so it's like there's all these different contr like contrasting ideas in the same picture it's like uh it's difficult i think but mm -hmm. Maybe it's no, just... I mean, nothing about it sounds easy. Trust me. It <laughs> sounds pretty intimidating, <laughs> to be honest. But it, it creates a really, really rich texture. Cool. You know, it, I mean, it's, it, it's, again, it's the type of, it's, it's gratifying because, you know, we live during a time where it's like clickbait, clickbait, clickbait. You know, people's attention spans are like this now. And, and to see artwork, and, and this applies to the both of you guys, where you really have to you have to look and focus and think about it is really rewarding. It's so rewarding. And, um, you know, Greg, we have, um, you know, we have the both of you guys' artwork up side by side. So, and it's, to me, it's, it's kind of remarkable that the both of you guys are so skit like, so again, Matt, we're not quite so familiar with your earlier work, but like I just saw some of your more representational work on Instagram. I was like, okay, he knows what he's doing. And then we have a, a you know, the image of Greg's work we have up. It's a, it's a curtain that's like something out of a freaking titian. It's bonkers. It's, yeah. it's, it's like, and, and I don't say hyper realistic in a photographic sense because it doesn't read flat. It doesn't read like it's distorted by some intermediary middleman wrote mechanical entity um your your work it's so interesting that you started with abstraction greg because you and, and your paintings run the gamut between super super tight hyper realistic and i mean like perceptual organically perceptual realism to these these like really decadent patterns and swatches of of color and textile so we have um you know we have some of your work up so what is uh and again i think people looking at it are going to be like oh my you know they can see the the, the more abstract mm -hmm. origins but i don't know if you you are a very busy guy so i don't know if to be fair you have had the time to make to make any new artwork, but are oh. you thinking about continuing in this vein or elaborating on it or doing something different? For sure. So um, I guess kids and COVID have uh, disrupted <laughs> <laughs> the way yeah. things were going, but actually it provided a really great reflection period 
that mm -hmm. but <laughs> but I um one thing that I I think when I start painting again that I'm going to pursue is actually maybe a little bit more of a direction than that is going mm. and uh it's uh this idea that I had when I lived in Ithaca, New York, I uh, taught at the school and what, and it was a continuing, a continuing education school. And I really had a lot of great students because they wanted to be there and wanted, wanted to learn more about art. And I actually had quite a few students who were really great artists in their own right. And this one guy uh, worked in Ithaca, actually, there's a, under, underneath the entire city, there's a um, hydrogen collider, just like there is in Switzerland, where they oh study, the, you know, they just send a few atoms and send around this, like, mile-long loop underneath the whole city, and it collide atoms and then see what happens. So, and he actually worked on that. Ooh. And he so he was a physicist and he made these um he made this artwork where he folded uh different things in, in patterns hmm. and we collaborated on different things well i'd paint something realistic and then he would fold it oh my god and, and then i would take an image of it and i'd paint it r realistic again but it was all distorted mm -hmm this kind of rigorous way. And then we kept doing that. And we went to five or six different layers and it went into this really weird, bizarre looking thing. And then I figured out a way to do it by imposing these patterns that he had come up with and imagining them in these three dimensional folded ways and then paint them. And what I've realized now is that I can do that and take the figure and put this mm. really unusual layered abstraction and put it into a background that maybe is more simplistic. Mm. Yeah. So is it is that almost like a lens in in in, yeah, in, that, what, in that regard? Sure. Yeah. It's, sure. it's like a type of lens. It actually ends up looking more like uh, maybe a more uh, a lot more realistic, like Cecily Brown. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Mm. And to try to uh, and and in that way, it looks like one of Matt's paintings. Mm -hmm. And to try to combine those ideas, I think is something that I'm going to try to pursue. Oh my God, that sounds. Is that is that what you? Yeah, like, yeah, a little bit. Actually, maybe you could show the, the one most, of those. The latest layers. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Wow. <laughs> I should show you. So what we're looking at here, and we'll maybe send you these images. Yeah, yeah. This is like the folded version. Whoa. Oh, my. That's oh. awesome. Painted oh. It. That's fantastic. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So cool. Well, this is... The layer that of, uh, I think this is five layers deep. Oh my god! And oh wow. my god! Oh, and that then, is so cool. But then, when I thought I could simplify it more, because it started out as a straightforward portrait, it was just mm -hmm. a portrait. But then I realized that I could kind of paint that way, and it's still it's really hard to see the actual pattern. But if you overlaid it, you would see it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. Try to pursue. <laughs> that is fascinating. And you know what? It does. I could, yeah, I can see there's like, it, it does. There is a similarity between that and, and your, your recent painting, Matt, you know, yeah. in terms of like, especially when you're rendering fruit and stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. That's really, that's so, and you know that, that's so, that is so, okay. So something we talk a lot about is how, you know, Okay, how do I articulate this? Because this is something we'll be like having coffee and cleaning the bathroom and we'll be talking about this. So it's a big thing, but like it's, it's like discussed in the most banal moments of our lives. Anyway, the, the thing, and this is something we talk a lot about um, with our own artwork is how does it fit into this? And that 
it's like artwork so uniquely, like it inevitably does belong to a specific moment in time, you know, and I think people looking you know, at it years later, we'll have an idea of when that is, but then artwork also is, is, or at least when artwork's done well, it achieves both these things simultaneously. It's also timeless, right? Yeah, for sure. And, it's best. and yeah, and so I, I see that with both of you guys' artwork. It's just so, again, like there's, there's such like perfect time capsules, but on the other hand, um, I think you guys are so astute with the symbolism you employ because it's it's specific to you guys, but it's not unrecognizable. You know, it's enigmatic, but it's not, you, you know, it's not off-putting. It's not so, you know, you're you're so good about taking these, these visual elements, again, from our everyday life and kind of synthesizing them and creating something. And I think that kind of goes back to the base of what makes us most human when we look at something perceptually. And I, th I think that's just, that's really, that's, that's really fascinating. I know that's yeah. something you, you really, you think about that a lot more than I do with your artwork. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Trying to strike that balance between having something that is, you know, that has a, you know, relationship to the, you know, contemporary world that we're living in and, you know, is coming from some sort of, you know, genuine thought or feeling that I'm having reacting to the world around me. And, uh, you know, but also making it, it you, know, you know, hopefully making something that can, you know, withstand the test of time. You know, I... I, I, um, I love yeah. that sculpture that you, you just posted on Instagram, the... Uh, it's a male sculpture and it has his hand out like that. Oh, thank you. The Michelangelo torso. It's uh, it's fantastic, thank and you. I love the pose. I think I think it, it does achieve that. It, it for, I don't know why. I mean, you know, it, it's a contemporary pose. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a it's a it's a male. It's a kind of. It's a very vulnerable, effeminate pose that isn't typically associated with a big, hulking, physical because guy. So you're you're able to the, those those kinds of conversations were not have never really been associated with that right. kind of physicality. And it's it's I feel like it's just now more within recent history that people have been able to have more full conversations about men's emotions and vulnerabilities and things like that too. But it's. You know, again, just looking at you guys' artwork, it's really, I think it's so astute in, in that regard. And I, I look funny, but we have a monitor off to the side that, that we're looking at. And obviously, we'll have these images up for... They zoom in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But... It is... I mean, I think about that a lot as well. I mean, because I, I, I feel like, um, you know... As any like reasonable person, I feel like you want to kind of like react to the times we're in and like and draw inspiration from it, but you also don't want it to be like reactionary. Yeah. But, yeah. I feel like I try to be really careful about that, and maybe like I'm not, maybe you know sometimes I err too much on one side and too much on the other, but yeah. like it's you know it's just like I feel like I do try yeah. to like pull like, I try to pull from like art history, I try to pull from my everyday life, and I try mm -hmm. to also make things that I think people will care about. But I think like what you're saying too, is that like, I mean, that is like the, in essence, like if, if there is like a, you know, if like all art is in some way abstract, it is because it's trying to get to a time that's true. So, mm -hmm. it's just like, you don't need so you to, just actually. pull from all these things, you pull from the dirt in your lawn, you pull yeah. from the thing that is like going on in your life and you make something that will just like relate to like anybody at any time at any time. Yeah, you, know, you don't need to actually the concepts behind art. You don't really need to be right. They're not like physics in the way that like they're this whole new concept that no one thought about the world. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. it's in fact every it's something that everyone knows about the world. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, like that, that Titian painting of the Assumption. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. break my heart, in my Jesus. Opinion, in my opinion, you know, one of the greatest paintings ever made. 
and, and, and that is couched in a very particular political environment in Venice mm -hmm. where they were under siege for about 10 years. It was mm -hmm. an awful time period, disease, people dying, you know, economy grinding to a halt, just awful at war. Mm -hmm. and, and then it was all gone and Venice was triumphant. And mm -hmm. that's what the painting is. Everyone knew what that painting meant. Mm -hmm. the glory of the war being done and Venice's victory. Do we know that today? No. But we know what the feeling of glory is. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's the same as Michelangelo's um, David it was so steeped in the politics of the Medici family that when it was unveiled, people were so upset by the politics they were throwing rocks at it. Mm -hmm. but we don't know any of that today, you know. Mm -hmm. We know the feeling of what it feels like to, when we see David. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Watch that because his dick is so small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my viewing of that was really, <laughs> my viewing of that was, <laughs> was totally occluded by crowds. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think it's it's really, and, and those are two great examples of artwork that might have been made on a bit of a, of a, of a I think the thing about, the thing about artwork when it strives for truth and when it hits those two points simultaneously of being of its time but timeless is because it's made pure, purely on the offense. It's not, it's not something made defensively. It's not something reactionary at all. And I think yeah. the thing about um, Titian's assumption, Michelangelo's David, is if it was made, if it were made on the on the defensive, it was more in response to to other movements and climates in the world around it, and not necessarily an artistic climate or movement which predicated it or that it was trying to establish. You know, it really came about organically. And that's that's the thing about you guys' work, is you guys' work is, is you guys are really going in hard on the offense. And I'm not a sports person. <laughs> I think that's safe to say. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about as much like of a sports analogy I could, I could probably make. But I think that's what makes it successful. And that's what makes it artwork that stands on its own two feet. It's because you're not incumbent upon the narrative someone else presents for it to, to resonate, you know, it's really, really individual in that regard. Um, and I think that's why, you know, kind of like our, it's like any, anything in extremes is, ugh, you know, and it's like when you get conceptual art that's rigidly anti-drawing, anti-painting, anti all of art history, it's very empty. And then when you get highly, highly, highly academic representational art that, is anti anything after like 1850. Yeah. It's also hollow for the same reason. And both have certain utilitarian uses. Obviously both allow people to become fluent in specific languages. Um, and, and obviously I think you have to know the rules to break them well, which you guys both obviously are like, you really exemplify. Um, but I, I think that again, there's a reason why that kind of artwork won't be looked back on. And, and I'll be surprised if, categories that we have now like representation and abstraction exist in the future um, or at least are as mutable in the future because again I think people want to see something and have some sort of resonance with it and and the longer you know everything about the way artists tackle artwork now is relatively modern that it's not under you know the jurisdiction of of the church or a wealthy noble family as page you know the artists having the autonomy they have now and the art market having the autonomy that or at least the secularism that it has now is so it, it's still a very very young concept and, and market model Museums is a young thing like a uh, yeah, hundred years ago sure. museums were like cabinets of curiosity for like rich yeah people. they had like conch shells or whatever like next to your rembrandt you know yeah like, can you believe that there was like a snail this big? <laughs> <laughs> that was like a hundred years ago. That's what people were like talking about. Mm -hmm. so it's like even muse like museums a hundred years from now, like it's going to be different. People aren't yeah. going to be talking about in, in the same way we're talking about. Exactly, that. exactly, and that's kind of what brings me to, you know, I think I think we've we've run the gamut of you know the bit of the bit of questions that I, I sent, but I was wondering, I just wanted to ask you guys myself how you would respond to. 
again, people either in a super, super, like when, when I was an undergrad, there were some very, very conceptual staff members who were like, if you use a paintbrush, no matter what you do with it, like it's, it's dead. And then conversely, you have people who believe the opposite, where if it's not like a perfectly rendered, blah, 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 it's, it's, you know, defamatory, defamatory. Um, so I was, I was wondering how you guys, as you guys are in this kind of gray area, right? How you navigate between these crazy extremes and how you respond when people from either end comment on your work. Do you want to go for that? Sure. Um, well, <clears throat> I, I think, um, maybe making things is just very human mm -hmm. how you make them is up to you <laughs> yeah i just i i think that yeah. anyone who's saying you know don't use a paintbrush because it's dead is probably like fighting for their job or something <laughs> they always seem like very unhappy people yeah like their private lives must have been really yeah. like not yeah. cool or fun but, yeah it's just you know Use a paintbrush, don't use a paintbrush, it's kind of up to you. Yeah. <laughs> I do think that, I do think that the, if, if we're ter talking in terms of like education though, it's important to know your grammar. Yeah. How can you possibly be a poet without knowing grammar? Does that mean you need grammar in your poetry? No. Does it mean that you should have a, you know, do you need to be the editor for the New Yorker in your grammar? No. But it means you need to have some appreciation for grammar. Yeah. Yeah. People. And, you know, knowing, you know, you grow up by default right here in Western culture, you need to know Western painting. You know? Mm -hmm. So that's what you should know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, doing. yeah, I think you have to know the audience that you're, you know, speaking to. And they, like, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, um, and yeah, that whole idea of not using, you know, a brush. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, um, I, I, I've, I've been, you know, really interested in, you know, early human history. And I, I like, you know, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of these things are, you know, really deeply programmed into us. And I think we may have been using brushes since before we were actually, you know, homo sapiens. Yeah, so yeah. I, I don't think using a brush is an unnatural and, thing. And does and, that negate the fact that, like, like, you can write with a brush, right? Does that yeah. negate the fact that you shouldn't use a keyboard? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not, they're not, they don't negate each other. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. especially because like early forms of charcoal and well and how they still make like charcoal is like burning willow branches. Yeah, like the same way. You know. It's it's kind of and I and, and I, I also think it's interesting what you said, Greg, about you know, kind of understanding this background of Western art because then in turn when you look at art from other cultures, it gives you a newfound appreciation for that yeah. and how things developed concurrently. So I think you know, it's not an exclusionary viewpoint at all. I think if anything, it really, it really gives you more appreciation for something that's different. Um, and it was really funny when I worked as a Met at, when I worked as a Met at the Guard. When I worked as a Guard at the Met, it was very interesting to be stationed in the, um, the galleries from Africa and Oceania because they have a very textile rich culture and a lot of their patterns and their textiles looked like I mean it made that Brancusi look like light years behind it was it was incredible and you know again being able to to kind of look laterally yeah. from one culture to different ones as opposed to with staggering views was very very enriching so I think it really helps like what you're saying really really helps as you broaden your scope in every way sure. so yeah. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, like all art does, um, like it has that scope of things. Mm -hmm. and so, like you were saying before, like about, um, like if you get too technical, you sort of like get off track. If you get too mm -hmm. conceptual, you get off track. But like art is technical, it's conceptual, mm -hmm. it's intuitive, it's rooted in craft, it's rooted in like very ordinary mundane things. But it doesn't mm -hmm. take any one of those things too far. It has a balance. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's telling you to like 
paint without a brush or whatever. Like it's a tool to get you to like think about how you're approaching painting. So it's not mm -hmm. just maybe it's to get you to loosen up and not like focus mm -hmm. on craft, but like you like it, you know, what I also agree with you guys, like it's it's mm -hmm. more human than like human to like paint with a brush. But like the like you know, the first art that was ever made is probably some of the best art that was like ever made. Because oh my God. It's like pure communication. Like it's just yeah. like right. it's a spiritual thing that is just yeah. like a truth that is like a of experience. That's that's, being, that, that's being conveyed. And <laughs> mm -hmm. it's in an environment and they're conveying it and it meant and something that, to people. Most... That's a total success. And it and it had all the same considerations that making a the most refined painting we could possibly think of, like in a gallery, or the most refined yeah culture that's like at the Met, you know. Yeah. yeah. Is, they caves. all have the same considerations. It's all part of the cow, same. Everyone loves them, right? And it's all part of the same definition of art. Like those caves, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves them. So and they mm -hmm. communicate yeah. what they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because when you see those images you realize that there are animals with multiple heads and there are some some figures that start looking like you know, again it, it kind of are makes they abstract you, or real. I mean Exactly. But, you know, are they bison? You know, they're bison. Does that make? But they're, you know, they're abstract and real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you know, it's a part of their dreams. It's a part of their mythology. It's a part of, and those are those are also as real as like your observations because they're a part of the culture that you live with. Or more real than you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> But that's it's that's the sort of thing that I you know it's it's funny because I think a lot of people associate abstraction with something very contemporary and very of the moment, um, you know, and we keep going back to these older examples like just within this conversation, Titian, Rubin, um, you know, Lesko. Um, but it makes me it makes me wonder if five hundred years from now people will talk about someone like Helen Frankenthaler with the same reverence they might you know discuss discuss Holbein with or, or something, you know, again, like I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, I've had people say, oh, you're very picky with the artwork you like. Um, and, and it's a little baffling to them because there seems to be no consistency across genres. And it's like, well, no, I want to see something again, that's, that's more on the offensive and that's something that's striving for truth, you know, yeah. regardless. So it'll, it'll be, you know, and again, like a, a, a you know, an abstract painting that resonates so many of the same formal, what, what we would call formal um, uh, ideas have to be thought about in terms of shape and proportion and composition and how do you move the eye around. And, uh, you know, these choices are very deliberate. You go through, you know, um, clippings for a year to, to piece things together. So how do you guys think, how do you guys think, work that's like from the 1940s or 50s will be discussed and, and kind of been diminished into something that's a little bit more i don't want to say a cliche but absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. i was wondering do you guys think that will happen with abstraction so much given that it's relatively okay. new and yeah. no you think it will i think it already is i think like it's that. already yeah i mean I, I sort of agree i also think mm -hmm. people don't like care that much like because it's oh. also like it's seemingly so simple that it's easy to look past or something. Yeah. Um, mm. but it's I think decorative. That, like, it's decorative. But I think right. that mm. it, will, it will persevere because like what you're saying is like, um, like all these, like people, when you talk to people, they don't understand like the different genres or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's also just a tool to be able to explain to people like what's happened. Most yeah. of the people didn't really separate themselves like from the rest of history, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. They weren't like, okay, I'm doing something different now. They mm -hmm. were like, actually saw it in line with everything right. else, you know? It's, so I yeah, think that, that will also maybe just change and it'll just be more accepted as like uh, a part of American art or something, like something mm -hmm. that happened in North America, like all of these cultures coming together and creating like something that was like a little bit more distinctive that, uh, you know, like, I, you know, I don't, I just feel like, um, I think it's impossible to predict the, <laughs> the vogue of art, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. I, 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 I listened to this uh, one podcast called History on Fire, 
Mm-hmm. And he's an Italian historian, and he did a whole episode on Carvaggio, which I highly recommend. Ooh. Three hours to listen to Carvaggio's life. Amazing. He, it's it so <laughs> well researched in a way that it's not researched in the English language, and he, and he translates it to English. Mm-hmm. Like, he talks about this one time that Carvaggio was in a tavern and ordered artichokes in Rome, and and the waiter goes to him, would you like that with butter or olive oil? And, <laughs> and Carvaggio flips out on him. He's like, well, you tell me, or something like that, and apparently draws a sword on him for this reason. And Obviously uh, olive oil. And, and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I love, and, I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the waiter like gave him a snarky thing. Is like, you tell me, you know. And mm-hmm. and Carvaggio had the equivalent like, you're only allowed to have a gun if you're a police officer, and he's working for the Pope, so he has a, a sword on him, and 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 he draws a sword because the the uh, the waiter has this snarky comment. And the only reason that we know this is because the waiter actually filed suit against Carvaggio for threatening his life because Carvaggio was threatening to kill him over, <laughs> over this snarky comment. Oh my God. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Carvaggio was a very, very difficult person. Yeah. Threatening to kill people over artichokes. <laughs> and <laughs> the, and because of this, he had so many people that disliked him that they tried to crush his art for oh. so long. And they yeah. tried to hide his aesthetic for so long. Mm-hmm. And they way outlived him. You know, yeah. his detractors way outlived him because of the way he lived. And he didn't really come back into vogue for a long time. But there was always a group of artists who secretly had to like him. But, yeah. uh, and he's done like really bad things but like he made these great paintings you know? yeah and um so you know it took a long time for people to acknowledge yeah he is a great painter but he's also a bad guy you know? yeah and i think i think anyone watching obviously they know the name caravaggio but you should google anibale was it karachi who was his contemporary, whose artwork was far more dominant for far longer yeah, yeah, that's what, during that time. And you, nobody knows who Karachi is. Like, I forgot his last name, and I read the damn placard, like, hundreds of times. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, but... I think you guys will love that Daniele Borelli, Bar- Bar- uh, History on Fire, Karachi, Karachi. Okay. Like, he even talks about, like, how he's exiled, like, all the way in this obscure island and made these great paintings is the only way he, like, remained alive because he was in a prison and, like, they let him out. And then, like, he made these paintings and escaped by making paintings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Like, it just... Anyway, no one can predict the, yeah. <laughs> the vogues of <laughs> art, you know? Yeah. No, that is that is true. That is true. Because I see that happen sometimes with them. Um, I've noticed even within popular culture, Jackson Pollock gets referenced more and more. And it's like, hold on a minute. Like, first, what he did, like, I have a little bit of synesthesia. So, you know, him painting to jazz, it's like, uh, you know. Like, mm. And then you look at who, under whom he studied, um, like Thomas Hart Benton, from the Art Students League. I mean, he was a Missouri-based artist who was in New York for a while and went back. And he was, I think in a lot of ways, he was quietly blacklisted because I think he was a Marxist or something around the turn of the century. Like if you go to the Met Museum, um, there's yeah, this room right. in the modern and kind of, yeah, it's this, this kind of series of different regions of America. And there's, there's you know, I, I think Pollock was a model for one of the figures. But the same way Pollock's paintings have this sensation of you know there's this rhythm within that within the thomas hart benton even though it's more representational again certain forms are just and there's a there's a visual rhythm there's there's definite moods and things that are evoked so you know it's it's like a pendulum vacillating between one end or another and um it it always kind of broke my heart a little bit to when i was a guard at the met to have people ask me where the impressionists were because they wanted to see like pictures of pretty little girls and flowery hats and it's like no you don't understand like that guy was like a 
a punk rock god of his time you know like it was it was like it was like cbgb in paris at that time like that was crazy you know and 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 i just i wonder as i see that starting to happen a bit as abstraction has just now kind of started to be around slightly long enough that's just something i personally worry about it definitely lends itself to this decorative uh instagram type of way you know yeah you can make a really great photo out of the abstract painting, you know. Mm -hmm. But I also think, like, you know, it, it's part of how people consume art. Like, not yeah. everyone's going to be, yeah. like, yeah, the separate. most sophisticated appreciator. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, why is Van Gogh, like, the most popular, yeah. like, artist in America or whatever? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's his story. It's, mm -hmm. it's the color or whatever. Like he's Like, he's good, but he's not, like, I'm I'm tired of looking at it. Like there's like yeah. other to see, but it's like it's okay for people to like things in a way that you didn't anticipate them to like things. Um, yeah. it's always gonna just be. It's also fun to derive them. And I'm curious what you guys think of, um, or at least what I've been aware of over the last few months of a boom in digital art, and then um, why? What it? What is? I, I would assume it's satisfying for you guys. What is so significant about the fact that you got, it's particularly given the type of imagery you make, that you still go through the process of making it by hand? Kind of a loaded question. Took uh, me a long time to get there. I just, I just love the, I mean, I, I guess like, I mean, I just love tactile things. Mm -hmm. It goes back to like working with material as a metaphor and and that's always kind of baffled me about painting. Yeah, what like if I can make a collage, like, why do I paint? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's. But it's like some. There's something about like because I'm not like I'm never gonna just make something that's exactly the same. Even if I painted something exactly the same, it's different because I made it. So it's like, I don't know. I just I just think that like I I I I just love it. Like I just and I think mm -hmm. other people do too. Like I think mm -hmm. being able to see the human mind at work on something. It's just like you respond to it, yeah. Um, and and that is even if it's just like you're painting with a newspaper or whatever. Like you're like read the newspaper, you're like ah, this is terrible news. But if somebody painted it, it'd be like wow, it's a nice painting. <laughs> like it's just like <laughs> it's just different. I don't know. It's yeah, yeah. I do think there's a bifurcation in terms of <clears throat> maybe there is a new way of expressing. Um, language, uh, artistic language, but I think that there is no replacement for an in-person experience with a, with a piece of art. Mm -hmm. Just like there's really no, in, are there different ways that people can communicate now, like we're doing over Zoom? You know, mm -hmm. maybe we were limited. It, we were, you know, this pandemic has made us realize that there are ways of communicating like this podcast over Zoom that has propagated different types of ideas that people can communicate and it ha has generally enriched us. But is it a replacement for uh, meeting each other in, in person? I mean, not, no, you know, it's not, it's just a different thing. And and in terms of art making, I think like the object of, is so central that it's hard to get around the fact that you're making an object. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I, uh, yeah. I think you're right. I think that's, yeah. And I think there's something about the, you know, the act of actually making something by hand and, you know, how the viewer you know, the viewer, you know, intuits like, oh, this is a handmade object. And, you know, that's kind of what prompts, you know, the, you know, intellectual, you know, pursuit, the, you know, the question about like, you know, what does this mean? And it, it you know, that's what kind of kicks off um, the, you know, the, you know, discussion of, you know, how you, you, you know start to you know take in those symbols and uh, you know how you you know frame them when you you know view the piece mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's something that we're never going to be able to get away from as human beings that 
that, mm-hmm. you know, that idea of a hum, uh, of, you know, of a handmade thing uh, just lends a different weight than anything else. And you want to live with it, you yeah. know, you want it mm-hmm. in your home or, you know, it, a lot of times I think we think of art in the sterile way, like Matt was saying, in a museum. Mm-hmm. That's not the way art has always been made, and it's not the way that people consume it now. You, you want it, you know? Like, mm-hmm. it's just, like, a, maybe a more basic thing and something that people don't think of as art in America, at least, like a bracelet or something like that. Mm. Right? My grandmother's bracelet. Mm-hmm. It's special to you in this way. And are you going to be satisfied with a digital representation of it? Yeah, it's a little silly. I mean, I mean, does that mean that there's not something special to you about like communicating with a, a cool image online that you see? No, it's just it's different. You know? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And and again, you know, I've I've and I I think a lot of it comes down to you know people don't have resources like art supply stores open or or perhaps able to to do, to set up e-commerce or something, but I've seen a real proliferation of digital artwork um, over the last few months. And a lot of it's beautiful. A lot of it's great, but I see it. And then I think like, this is kind of crazy, but I'm like, what if we get like an asteroid that passes too close or a solar flare or something? And like all these electronic files just (laughs) into ether, you know? You know, you're absolutely right. I actually heard this really good. It's one of my favorite historians. Uh, told us about you know she was talking about how when you go through your like parents photos you're just like oh I can't believe like you didn't like take better care of these or like they're so precious but then and then she's like yeah but think about all the things you have they're all online they're yeah all way more precarious like it only takes one glitch one changeover of the system and you yeah. want everything like, yeah yeah these are in a shoebox somewhere, <laughs> you know, yeah. and they're going to be discovered. Like, we actually have way less ability to preserve things in the digital era because mm-hmm. of the ubiquitousness of it. You're like, oh, it'll be there forever. Like, right, how many right. times have you purchased the same movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, I was bought, I, how many times have I streamed Great British Bake Off? You know, I mean, it's like, that's like my comfort right now. But, but I think it really goes, I, I, I wonder, again, if our, our increasing technological, or at least what we consider, what is technological for this time? Because, like, again, going back to ancient Rome, their aqueducts were super high tech, you know, like there was an, a tremendous amount of engineering and brain, but it's just what we consider to be technological advancement now is, is so incredibly digital. I wonder if it, again, makes certain certain categories and genres such as abstraction versus representation, um, if it makes those distinctions a a little less powerful because by virtue of just making something with your hands, that is a distinguishing factor in and of itself. It's almost like the field is already shrinking and just, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting perspective to have. I mean, I I also think that's just a new tool. Like I think you, Mm -hmm. I mean, even digital stuff, like you are making it your hands. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But it's just like, you know, you're just using a different kind of tool. I, I don't think we've hit a point where we're really experiencing sophistic, a sophisticated use of, I mean, I guess that's very argued. I mean, someone, someone's going to listen to this and be like, this guy's an idiot. But like, um, like, we just aren't like at the point where we're like producing digital art that is like at the, like a, the highest level that's yeah. possible. I, like, I, um, I agree. I, I, uh, it's so cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think uh, I think it's still being uh, you know treated as kind of a novelty. People are still exploring it, and it's not necessarily being used because it's the you know because you know it, it's you know the most you know tram you know it's the most you know transformative you know the most uh, you know powerful way to get that idea across. It's it, it's about the novelty often times of just trying to do something with a new technology with a new yeah. media yeah and i feel like harkens back to again if you're too focused on craft or you're too focused on concept yeah 
too focused on novelty. You're losing like the art that like has to fit within like the bracket of the definition. It has right. to have all of those things. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. novelty is a part of art as well, but it's yeah. not mm -hmm. all of it. You can be so novel like, like using charcoal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would actually be like a very refreshing novel thing, right? <laughs> right. But like, you know what? But like, that's a, it's like there is this like working definition that has existed for thousands of years across cultures. Like, I mean, we've been mostly talking about like Western art, but it could easily be like applied to like any other kind of like culture. Like, it's a universal definition of what art is. It's this like feeling, mm -hmm. like a communication mm -hmm. system. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 um, I like this idea of, you know, these different attributes of art and like, you know, I, I, I have an idea or, you know, I, yeah, I have an image in my head of something almost like a, you know, almost like a pie chart and, you know, there's all these different slices of the pie and you have a dot in the middle and it's like, you know, how far from the middle do you stray and, uh, to, yeah. you know, to, you know, you know, so that your artwork can contain a little bit of each of these things and how do you balance all of those ideas to make something that interests you and feels like it, you know, communicates both now and hopefully in the future. And it goes balance. You've mentioned that earlier, Matt, you know, balance about, and I think that's more, that's more astute than, you know, I mentioned something about being in a gray area, but I think balance is, is, is pinpointing much more you know, at least that, that, you know, that mental place than, than perhaps a gray area because the, you know, the gray implies being unaware. Whereas with, with balance, you get a, the opposite implication of you being hyper aware of what you're, you're kind of, you know, working between the two points between which you're at. Um, so I think that's really, that's sure. really great. And, and again, Matt, I want to ask you one, one question. We have um, a piece up of yours and I'm not entirely sure um the title well i was wondering what surface are you painting on because again the paint is so textured it almost looks like it's old peeling plywood or something that it's on top of well it's yeah so i i painted it on like on plywood old peeling plywood no i just i i, I, I <laughs> no i got a, a wood panel and mm -hmm. in uh, so in like 2016, I had painted a huge, pa I painted a mile long painting. And oh, I, I had yeah. hundreds of gallons of paint, like left over uh, from that. Uh, by hundreds, I mean mm -hmm. 100. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but still like a crazy amount of paint. Yeah. Uh, he, yeah, he was, so, uh, did he tell you this? Was this for the DNC? Yeah, yeah, it was for the DNC. Uh -huh. yeah. Which obviously we won. We're, it, everything's great. <laughs> America is like just going on like this amazing like streak right now. It's just been amazing. It's like I feel like I'm living in a dream. But uh, we too, but for the opposite. <laughs> well, you know, maybe you should have painted a better painting. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, now that is a unifying political <laughs> idea there. <laughs> <laughs> I had like, a ton of paint left over and I was making all these paintings that were like really textured and like and then I realized like not all of them were great so uh, and they're just sitting in my basement so I like started painting I, I started using that I was doing collages and and they're really precise and then mm -hmm. there was these totally crazy free paintings that were in my basement and I was like, I'm gonna combine this because I, I mm. have so I had an idea of what I wanted to do and I had kind of like made like a collage, but it was just a source. Like it was just I didn't want to like copy anything. It was just mm -hmm. like I know I want some fruit, I know I like want like some color in this area. And then I just started taping so I could get really precise lines and then I would tape out an area and just and be like, okay, this area is gonna look exactly like grapes or whatever. And then like, mm -hmm. and I was like, this area is gonna be like just the outline and like a crazy, I'm, I'm gonna react to the underpainting. So it, it, it was like a, you know, it was like a give and take. And I, mm -hmm. I feel like the best paintings and the be or the best like artwork in general is like that, where it's just like, I have these ideas and I think I know what I want, but I also have to listen to what it wants. 
else because it's yeah. probably stronger than me. So like, yeah. it's going to tell me where it's going and I just have to feel like, okay, I thought we we're going to go left here, but like, it's <laughs> yeah. But if it, if it, but it occurred to me while I was making that painting though, mm -hmm. that I had taken it too far in that one direction mm. um, about it being perfectly representational. Mm -hmm. And it's not what the painting was about. So you mm -hmm. have to know, because it's like the painting's like, this is, hey man, like this is what I'm about. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And then, you know, Greg, I see your work and I, I was wondering where you, where you, do you, okay, this is, this is, okay, I was kind of embarrassed to ask this question because we've known you for years and I thought, oh my God, like I should know this. Um, but when it comes to your patterns, do you invent them or are they observed from different places? And if so, are they, I see like a little bit of like Islamic tile. Yeah, I, kind of. I, uh, I take photos, I, I keep a journal of patterns. Oh, how cool. And, <laughs> oh. and actually, I've come to note that there aren't as many patterns as you might think. There are just variations of patterns. There's only two. Oh. <laughs> 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 Maybe some, some Alan Turing binary code pattern development. So then I've been curious about like how far back do certain patterns go in art, you know? And I mean, I haven't done like a tremendous amount of research because they're so difficult to really track down. But like some of them that I use all the time, like the one that I showed you, the basis of the pattern of that really abstract portrait that I showed you actually is a pattern that's based on a Roman floor tile at the Met. Oh. And, you know, so I, yeah, so I just keep, I have all these files of patterns that I observe. Oh my God. That's awesome. It's like you're yeah. creating your own pattern encyclopedia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there are actually different books that are written about it. One of them is called The Grammar of Ornament. And there, you know, there are different, actually, believe it or not, like theories on decorative patterns oh my god yeah have uh, have you looked into the math behind um yeah uh, behind a lot of patterns yeah and you know i probably got a little too absorbed into that right before kids and covid um, because i would say that i was assigning too much meaning to those types of things yeah you know kind of creating your own sort of like, well, five means this, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, it could, Numerology. you know, in terms of, yeah. you know, the Pentagon and forts and that comes from Michelangelo design, the first, like the first fort that every fort in the Western world is based mm -hmm. on the Pentagon. And that's why the Pentagon is called the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every battery, in, um, in the Western world is based on a Pentagon. For some reason, that's the geometry that's best for, even though, even if they have the spikes are based on a Pentagon pattern for all of San, old San Juan is based on the Pentagon pattern. Mm -hmm. if, uh, for, uh, if cannonballs are gonna come at this angle, then a Pentagon is best for, for repelling that attack. And like mm -hmm. literally the architecture of every roof in yeah. Paul San Juan is built so it can stand a cannonball attack. Of course, that's not applicable anymore, but you know, <laughs> yeah, you really get involved in the meanings of the different types of patterns uh, mm -hmm. and the, the numerical um, association. But really, now I'm just, I think that meaning is. We'll put, we'll put an end to this for now and then continue yeah. the conversation a, a little bit afterwards. I know you guys are, are busy, but um, to everyone tuning in, thank you guys so much for watching. Again, make sure to look in the video description to see links to Greg and Matt's website so that you guys can see even more of their work. There will be social, hand, social media handles on there as well um, so that you guys can stay abreast of what they're up to and 
yeah, thanks again for watching in this current yeah, climate. Um, by, by, yeah, by virtue of people tuning in, they're, they're supporting visual arts and culture, given the other cacophony going on. So with that being said, we'll bid adieu to this we're, we're panel. Pretty hard, thank you. <laughs> and, That's all right. all right. Cheers. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, so good to see you. Cheers. Thank you right, for cheers. Thank you guys. Yeah, Got my glass. <laughs>